Here we have Beowulf, Beowulf, uh, Dover Thrift Editions, 2015, translated by Robert K. Gordon. We're going to start with chapter 29. Then the bold man went himself with his troop to lead the meadow by the sea, the wide shores, to tread the meadow by the sea, the wide shores. The world candles shone, the sun bright from the south. They went on their way, quickly. They marched till they heard that the protector of earls, the slayer of Ang Angenthiao, the worthy young war king, was bestowing rings in the court. Beowulf's arrival was quickly proclaimed to Higelac that the defender of warriors, the shield comrade, was come alive to the palace there, to the court, unscathed from the battle play. With speed, as the mighty one ordered, a space was cleared within the hall for the newcomers. Then he who survived the combat sat down opposite him, kinsman opposite kinsman, when in solemn speech with chosen words he greeted his gracious lord, the daughter of Hayrath went about throughout that hall building with mead vessels. She loved the people, bore the flagon to the hands of the heath dwellers. Higelac began graciously to question his companion on the high, in the high hall. Desire to know the exploits of the sea geats was strong upon him. How fared ye on the voyage, dear Beowulf? When on a sudden thou hast desired to seek combat afar over the salt water, warfare at Hiorat, surely thou hast somewhat mended for Rothgar, the famous prince, his wide-known sorrow? In my heart's grief, for that I was troubled with surgings of sorrow, I put no trust in my loved man's venture, long while I besought thee that thou shouldst have, no have not to do with the murderous monster, let the South Danes themselves fight out the struggle with Grendel. I utter thanks to God that has granted me to behold the unscathed. Beowulf spoke, son of Ecthiel. That is known, my lord Higelac, to many men, the famous encounter, what struggle there was between Grendel and me in that place, where he brought very many sorrows upon the victorious Sildings, lasting oppression. I avenged all that. Thus, none of Grendel's kin upon earth has cause to boast of that uproar at dawn. Not he who lives longest of the loathly race, gnarled and snared in sin. Even there did I come to that ring hall to greet Rothgar. Straightway the famous son of Hilfdeen, when he knew my purpose, assigned me a seat beside his own son. His troop was making merry. I have never seen under the vault of heaven greater mead joy of men sitting in hall. At times the famous queen, she who establishes peace among the peoples, moved throughout the hall, encouraged the young men. Often she gave a ring to, the war to a warrior ere she went to her seat. At times Rothgar's daughter bore the ale flagon before the veterans to the earls in the high places. Then I heard men sitting in hall fame, Friwaru, where she bestowed the nail-studded vessel on the heroes. She sung gold adorned its promised to the gracious sons of Froda. The friend of the Sildings, the ruler of the realm, has brought that about and counts it again that he should settle with the woman a part of his deadly feuds and struggles. It is always a rare thing when a little while after the fall of the prince, the murderous spear sinks to rest, even though the bride is of worth. That's the end of chapter 29. Here we have 30. That may rankle with the prince of the Heathobards and each thane among the people when he goes in hall with the bride that a noble scion of the Danes should tend the warriors on him gleams the armor of his forefathers, hard and ring-marked, the treasure of the Heathoboards, whilst they were able to wield those weapons until they led their dear comrades and themselves to ruin at the shield play. This is still um, Beowulf speaking. Then an old 
spear warrior who gazes on the treasure, who bears in mind all the slaughter of men, speaks at the beer drinking. Grim is his heart. He begins in mournful mood to test the thoughts of the young warrior by the musings of his mind, to stir up evil strife, and he utters these words. Canst thou, my friend, recognize the sword, the precious blade thy father bore to battle, where the Dane slew him when under his helmet for the last time the bold Sildings held the field when Withergild lay low after the fall of heroes. Now some youth or other of those murderers exulting in his adornments walks here in the hall, <clears throat> boasts of the slaughter and wears the treasure, which thou shouldst rightfully own. Thus at all times he admonishes and stirs up memories with baneful words till the season comes when the bride's thane slumbers, strained with blood after the sword stroke, his life forfeited because of her father's deeds. <coughs> Excuse me. The other escapes with his life. He knows the country well. Then on both sides are broken with solemn oaths of earls. Afterwards, deadly hatreds surge up against Ingild, and his love for his wife grows cooler from his anguish of mind. Wherefore, I t look not for the goodwill of the Heathobards, not for much loyalty, void of malice to the Danes, nor from friendship. I shall speak on once again about Grendel, that thou, the giver of treasure, mayest know well what was later the issue of the hand struggle of heroes. After the jewel of the sky glided over the fields, the monster came raging, the dread night foe to seek us out, where safe and sound we held the hall. There was war fatal to Honcio, a violent death to the doomed man. He was the first to fall, the girded warrior. Grendel devoured him, the famous liege man. He swallowed the whole body of the loved man. Nevertheless, the bloody tooth slayer, his thought set on evil was not minded to go out again from the gold hall empty-handed. <clears throat> but strong in his might, he pitted himself against me, laid hold with ready hand, a pouch hung wide and wondrous, made firm with the artful clasps. It was all cunningly devised by the power of the devil and with dragon skins. He, the savage worker of deeds, proposed to put me into it, though guiltless, with many others, it would not come to pass thus when I stood upright in my wrath. It is too long to tell how I gave requital to the people's foe for every ill deed. Therefore, there, my prince, did I bring honor on thy people by my deeds. He escaped forth. For a short space he enjoyed the pleasures of life, yet his right hand remained in Heorot for a token of time. And he, departing thence, wretched, sank down, sad in mind, to the bottom of the mirror. When morning came, and we had sat down to the banquet, the friend of the Sildings rewarded me richly for the deadly onslaught with beaten gold and with many treasures. There was singing and merriment. An aged Silding of great experience told tales of long ago. At times, one bold in battle drew sweetness from the harp. The joy would, <clears throat> at times, wrought a measure true and sad. At times, the large-hearted king told a wondrous story in fitting fashion. At times again, and at times again, an old warrior, bowed down with age, began to speak of the youths of prowess in fight. His heart swelled within him when, old in years, he brought to mind many things. <clears throat> Thus we took our pleasure there, the livelong day. Sorry. <clears throat> Thus we took our pleasure there the live long day, till another night came to men. Then forthwith again Grendel's mother was ready to avenge her grief. Sorrowful she journeyed. Death, the hostility of the wedders, had carried off her son. The monstrous woman avenged her child. She slew a warrior in her might. Their life went out from Escher, a wise counselor through many years. Nor, when morning came, might they, the men of the Danes, consume with fire him who had been made powerless by death, nor lay the loved man on the pyre. She bore off 
that body in a friend's embrace under the mountain stream that was to Rothgar the heaviest of the sorrows which for a long while he laid hold on the prince of the people. Then the prince, lamenting, entreated me by thy life that in the press of the floods I should perform a deed of prowess, should hazard my life, should achieve an heroic exploit. He promised me reward. Then I found the grim, terrible guardian of the depths of the surging water, who is known far and wide. There for a space was hand-to-hand -hand grappling. The water welled with blood, and in that hall in the depths I cut off the head of Grendel's mother with a gigantic sword. With violence I tore her life from her. I was not yet doomed to death, but the protector of earls, the son of Hilfdeen, gave me again many a treasure. End of chapter 30. Here we are, chapter 31. Thus did the king of the people live as was fitting. In no way did I lose the rewards, the guardian of my strength. But he, the son of Helfdeen, gave me treasures into my own keeping. <clears throat> Them I will bring and gladly proffer to thee, king of warriors. Once more, all favors come from thee. I have few close kinsmen, save thee, Higlak. Then he commanded to be brought in the boar image, the banner, the helmet riding high in battle, the gray corslet, the splendid war sword. Afterwards he spoke. Rathgar, the wise prince, gave me this battle garment. He expressly bade that I should first declare his good will to thee. He said that King Hiorogar, Hier Hirogar, prince of the Sildings, had it, the breast armor for a long space, that nevertheless he would not give it to his son. The bold hero weird, though he was loyal to him, used all things well. I heard that four horses, reddish yellow, every wit alike, came next in order. He gave him possession of steeds and stores, thus must a kinsman do, and not weave a cunning net for another. Prepare death for a comrade with sweet guile. To Higlak, stout in fight, his nephew was very loyal, and each was mindful of the other's pleasure. I heard that he presented to Higd that neckband, the precious, wondrous treasure, which Wealthiao, the prince's daughter, gave him, together with three steeds full of grace and furnished with gleaming saddles. When she had taken the ring, her breast was made fair. Thus the son of Ecthiel, a man famous in battle, was bold in brave deeds. He lived honorably. Never did he slay his hearth companions in his drunkenness. Was His was not a savage mind, but fearless in fight. He guarded the precious gift which God had given him with the greatest strength among men. Long was he despised, for the men of the Geats accounted him worthless, nor was the lord of troops minded to do him much honor on the mead bench, and they indeed, they thought indeed that he was slothful, an unfit chieftain. A recompense came to the famous man for every slight. Then the protector of earls, the king mighty in battle, bade them bring in the sword of, of Rethel, decked with gold. There was not at that time with the Geats a better treasure among swords. He laid that in Beowulf's bosom and gave him seven thousand measures of land, a house and princely rank. To them both in that country land, domain, ancestral claims had come by natural right, but more to Higelac, a wide realm, in that he was the more illustrious. It came to pass in later days among the warriors, when Higelac was laid low and battle swords slew Hirdred under cover of his shield. After the bold battle heroes, the warlike Silfings, sought him mid his victorious troop, pressed hard in fight, the nephew of Hereric, that then the wide realm came under Beowulf's sway. He ruled well for fifty years. He was then an aged king, an old guardian of the land, till a dragon, which guarded treasure in a burial mound, a steep rock, began to show 
his might on the dark nights. A pathway lay beneath, unknown to men. Some man entered there, greedily seized the pagan horde, tricked the keeper of the treasure with thievish cunning while he slept, so that he was enraged. All right, we'll quit there. That's the end of chapter 31.